thank you for this awesome start to our, our morning. Um, I just want to express my appreciation to Pastor Michael for letting me uh, occupy his pulpit. I know that it, is, uh, it can be a little stressful letting a student pastor get up front and to speak his mind. And I have done that in the past. Um, today, uh, I have, about a month ago, well, when I knew about uh, preaching uh, today, I, I thought about what I wanted to do and I believe that the Lord has impressed me to give my testimony today. And man, sometimes it's, it's not always easy to give a testimony, but by God's grace, I will endeavor to um, give glory to his holy name. So if I, if I lose it a little bit, bear with me. Um, as well, I have a, a little disclaimer. My, uh, I've got some pictures of my dad up here, so you can't laugh at him. Because I know he has given me a hard time in the past about uh, calling me baby cakes and all these different things. So you, you can't laugh at his pictures. So, um, but with that, um, I just want to ask you guys to bow your heads with me as we uh, have a word of prayer. And we enter into the presence of God once again. Heavenly Father, I thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. And I praise your holy name for a life, my life, and how I have lived for you, Lord. I know that it's been bumpy and it's been rough, Lord, but I know that you've been there every second of the way. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me right now, that you would step in front of me, that you would hide me, Lord. May be consecrated before you today. May your light shine. May you be glorified here today, Lord, not me. I see things in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. So I believe that every Christian has a testimony. And just a question to ponder is, have you found yours? Do you know what your testimony is? Do you know what God has done in your life that has brought you from, from the beginning of life, the beginning of days, to the point that you are today? Today, I have, I have spoken my testimony several times, but I've never spoken it in front of a congregation before. And I pray that, uh, that God will bless you as much as he blessed me throughout my life and the things that I've been through. But growing up in Christ takes time. And having a testimony of how Christ, Christ's love has changed your life is the difference in somebody else's life. It can make that change. It can, it can, it can bring you to a place where, where you can witness to somebody else. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says that they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the power of their testimony. And today I believe that there is a power in a testimony. And I believe that, that as we, as Christians, grow up into Christ, that we will, um, we will gain a testimony that will benefit us, will benefit others, and will glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that, I just want to begin my story. It starts in two different places, Kodiak, Alaska, and Portland, Maine. And in these two places, my parents lived. Well, actually, they weren't my parents yet. They were, they were separated, but um, we'll, get, we'll get there. Uh, and through divine leading, my, uh, my dad had a friend. His best friend was dating my mom's sister. And so they decided that they were going to play a little matchmaking. I believe it was God doing a little matchmaking through them. But through this matchmaking, they called up my mom, and they said, look, we have a one-way plane ticket for you to come out to Kodiak, Alaska. And... My mom was like, wow, this is, this is what I need. You know, I need to get away from this. She was in a rough relationship at the time, and, and she was struggling with, a, with, a, with her only son. She was just graduated from high school, and she was really in a hard place. And she felt a call to go to Kodiak, Alaska, for God knows whatever reason. I mean, but we'll, we'll see that shortly. But um, she jumped on the plane, and as she went, she, she told me she, she had no idea what she was getting into. But all she knew was that she was, she was going to meet some guy or whatever. And upon arriving in Kodiak, um, my, my mom met my dad. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, she couldn't stand him. <laughs> she, she, she couldn't stand him. He was just the, the worst guy ever I, for, in her mind at that time. And she was a pretty, she was a hothead back then. And, um, and obviously they weren't, they weren't uh, raised in the Adventist church. They weren't raised in any kind of Christian background at all. Um, but... When my mom met my dad, he was the only man in, in, of all the guys that she met in the bar there that uh, was willing to take care of her son. 
And that was what, what wooed her, her over to, um, what won her heart, so to speak. So as, as time went on, it's kind of interesting because after they met, two months later they were married. <laughs> I know, it's fantastic. But so with this two months, uh, after this two months, they, they got married and my mom moved down to Spokane. She had my older brother. And it, through, a, through a, f- a few things of going back and forth between Spokane and Kodiak, my dad was in jobs up there and he was coming back to Spokane and trying to settle, have roots uh, in Spokane. And uh, my sister was born. Um, and then I came along in uh, January of 1983, and this was all in the course of uh, seven, uh, 80 to 83. And uh, yeah, this is a picture of my dad, my mom, <laughs> and uh, my older brother, Michael, Vanessa, and that's me with the arrow above my head. Um, I was a fat little baby. I was uh, 10 pounds, well, I was 9 pounds, 13 ounces when I was born. Uh, I think some of you ladies might understand that a little bit more than I do, but... <laughs> But uh, I must say that my parents have been married for over 33 years now, and that is a huge praise in my life because it has given me a witness. Um, they have witnessed to me of their devotion to each other and how they have served God through their marriage. And I'm going to get a little bit more in detail about some of the things in my life that happened that um, kind of did not reflect their, um, their, their devotion to each other. But... Um, uh, during this course of time between the 80 and 83, my parents, or my dad had told my mom, one of the stipulations upon uh, getting married was that uh, my dad said, oh, look, I want to be more religious. And whatever reason that was for, I believe that God stuck that, that desire in his heart. Because it is the goodness of God that leads us to per- repentance. And I believe that God was leading my parents to a point that they were going to be um, forever changed and that they were forever going to have a, a place in God's kingdom um, as long as they served him faithfully. But uh, now my parents, they were smokers. They were drinkers. They were, you know, heavy in the world. And so at this time, um, they, were, they, were, they were struggling with life. They were trying to get on their feet. They just had their third child, as you can see. And, and um, you know, sometimes it's not easy living in the world and having three kids. They had hardly any money. Um, but uh, we'll get into that a little bit here in a second. But um, my mom received a postcard in the mail. And this is by, I believe, divine providence. Because why in the world would a postcard, a religious postcard, come in the mail? I mean, what, you know, it's crazy. But um, being that my mom and dad were smokers, um, it said, Stop Smoking Clinic Revelation Seminar. Who would have thought the Adventists were sending a postcard to my mom and dad's house 30 years ago? It's, I mean, impossible. You know, but I believe God has a plan, and God has a plan for my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to endeavor to explain it to you in more depth here. So they were convicted to go, they were moved to quit smoking, and they were baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Wow, and it changed our lives forever. It changed my life forever. And I stand before you today a changed man because of that decision that they made 30 years ago. But it is from here that my story uh, jump starts. And uh, I have not known a life outside the Adventist church. I was born and raised into it, obviously, as I said. And, um, you know, we certainly, growing up, we, we struggled a lot because my parents didn't have a lot of money. Um, we, we were, uh, excuse me, we, uh, we had everything paid for by, uh, by people in the church. We, we went through Adventist education because of people like you in the church. We, we grew up um, not being able to participate in a lot of things at schools because we, we couldn't afford it. I was able to do Pathfinders, go on school-sponsored skiing trips, and um, do swimming lessons and all sorts of different things because of, of donors in the Adventist church. And praise the Lord that, that he, he, um, he gave them, my parents the dedication and the faith to work with us and to study with us and to train us up in the way that we should go. And um, as... as uh, as I was growing up, I remember that we, we had a very close family knit. We were very closely bonded. And I believe that was because of our, our lack of physical things, physical necessities, and because of our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, um, that it gave us a, a, uh, um, a desire to want to be with each other, to want to serve each other, to want to, to, want to be a family together. And, you know, certainly, I mean, there was times when we, we lived off of food stamps. My parents were living off of credit cards and and. 
Um, we, we all, sometimes all we had was beans and bread and rice, you know, and, but somehow, some way, oh man, <laughs> sorry, I'm, uh, somehow, some way, God provided everything that we needed. <sighs> Excuse me. Yeah. <sighs> But it was, you know, just seeing those things happen, seeing those, those instances in my life where God is working in my life and showing me that he cares for us and he, that he has a plan for my life and that people were supporting us in the church, excuse me, <laughs> meant the world to me. Jesus saved me. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, man. As you can see, this is a little bit emotional for me. Sometimes it's, uh, man. Sometimes, you know, even though I believed in God, you know, I wasn't always good. But God was good. But God was faithful. And there's many times in my life that I, that I, that I walked away, that I turned my back on him. And, but I knew that he was there. I knew that because I, I, I believed it. My parents taught me that. They told us that he would never leave us. Now, as a kid, I was very happy. I was very energetic. Uh, here's one of my little plain moments uh, back in the day. I don't even remember how old it was in that picture, but I know I was having fun. <laughs> uh, but um, I was a very fun-loving guy. I, I loved everybody. I loved to, to hang on to people. I loved to hug people and hold people. I mean, that was the desire of my heart, to want to, to, want to just reach out to other people. And that is still my desire today, to want to be friends with everybody. And sometimes people don't want to be friends with me, and that's fine. But I, want, I would love to be friends with all of you, but I'll promise you I don't have enough time in the day or the week or the month or the year to spend time with all of you people, to get to know of you. But I pray that by God's grace and his leading that, that you will trust me when I say that. Now, it's an interesting, and my parents told me later on in life that uh, I changed from a quiet kid to a loud kid. Now, I don't know how that was even possible, but apparently I went to summer camp and I don't remember anything about it except for the first day I arrived. And they said when I went to summer camp, I was quiet as can be. I was, I, when I was a baby, they said I, when I cried, I was just, I, it was just like a little squeak. I, was, I wouldn't make any noise. And I was, they just said I was the happiest baby they had ever seen. And, but uh, as, after I came back from camp, they said I was just totally the opposite. I, I am the way I am now, you know. <laughs> and some of you may know that as me, I'm, I'm loud, I'm boisterous, I'm excitable, I'm, a, I'm excitable, I'm in, I, I, am, I am energy filled. And I mean, you know, now that I'm 30 years old, it's certainly been, um, uh, the life has taken a toll on me. But I promise you, if you would have known me 10 years ago, you wouldn't be able to keep, able to keep up with me, I promise. Um, so growing up in church, um, my dad, he used to teach us in our youth class, um, we're just going to move along here. And he used to just, um, we spent 10, almost 15 years studying the, the, Daniels and, or the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. And, and really working, he really worked with us in, in understanding the sanctuary doctrine. And I promise you, that is the most amazing doctrine that we have in this church, is the sanctuary doctrine. And really studying out Daniel and Revelation, how they, how they mingle together and how they're, they're just so inspired by God. That, that it really gave me a challenge. I mean, we knew these prophecies so good that we could write the whole thing out. Verses, dates, time periods, everything by, by memory. And it was an amazing time. That I'm so glad that my dad put the effort and time into to training me up, to, to teach, teaching me about the prophecies and teaching me about, about Jesus and his second coming and, and the, 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 the soon coming judgment. But... Um, while my dad was teaching us, we also participated in a lot of youth activities. My dad was very eccentric. He was very uh, hands-on, and he loved to get us involved and to work with uh, people in the community. So we started a youth project type of thing where we went around, and we had like 35 youth, and we would just go, and we would all mass over to somebody's house's house and just, just totally destroy their yard. I mean, clean it up, but destroy it, you know what I mean? But uh, it was so much fun, and I really loved those experiences growing up. 
but as I became a teenager and I started um, developing kind of a sense of self-awareness um, and realizing that I could start making my own choices, I started to fall away. I started to, to go my own way. And to my shame, um, it, was, it was certainly not a way that I've, I've desired to go. Um, looking back, it, it is, I could have saved myself so much heartache and so much pain um, because of, you know, some of the choices that I made, but um, certainly these choices, they, they hurt my spiritual life. And instead of, instead of looking to God, I started looking to myself. I started looking um, for, for relationships. I started looking to work and all these things to, to fill that emptiness that was starting to fill in my life. And I found, I found it easy to spend time watching movies and, and just, just putting myself into work. I mean, I love to work around the house and I help my parents out. And I, just, I would literally wake up at 6 in the morning and I, I wouldn't stop working until 11 o'clock at night. Just nonstop go, 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 you know. And, but however, by, believe, by, by keeping busy um, all the time, I was actually hurting my spiritual life. I was hurting myself and I was, I was moving myself towards a place that, um, that, uh, that was going to be to my detriment. But um, I started dating, and w wouldn't you know that I actually liked girls? I mean, who would have thought, you know? But uh, this became a crutch, and I bounced from relationship to relationship all through my teenage years and into my 20s. And I really found it um, kind of a, a sense of neediness that I had. And I, I didn't realize, I didn't know what it was, and I, I struggled with this, and I was like, why, why do I feel this sense to want to be with somebody? Why do I always have to have a relationship and be in the, you know, physically attached to somebody? And I struggled in my mind and my heart with that, and I knew what I was doing, and I was doing wrong, and I was, I was rejecting God, and I was doing the wrong things. And I, I didn't struggle with anything like the, the drugs or the, the party scene or anything like that, but my, my downfall was, was relationships. And I just really wanted to be loved by somebody. I really wanted to love somebody. And, and that was just, it was, the, it was the burden of my heart, the burden of my life. But I tell you what, I didn't find happiness in that. I did not find happiness in that. And I sat down with my parents one day, and my sister, and we were talking about um, some of the things in our lives. And um, we were discussing about what, uh, uh, you know, when I was born, I had a jaundice. And uh, for the first two weeks of my life, I sat in a crib under a Billy Rubin light, and the only time I was fed or held was when I was, to, was, when I was fed. And at those two weeks in a, in a baby's life, even the first month, it is imperative that a baby gets the, the attention and the nurturing and the love that, that it needs. And, and we, we sat there and we thought, you know, it's like, wow, you know, this could be a reason why I have such a dependency upon um, relationships and love and wanting to be nurtured and to care for, to be cared for. And... It just, I just broke down. My whole family, we were just in tears because, you know, my parents, they were like, we're sorry, we didn't know, you know? And, and certainly as they told me, as I became well, that I used to cling to them, and they wouldn't even have to hold me. I would just hold on to them with everything that I had. And that's where I got the nickname Monkey Man. <laughs> and it kind of stuck with me into my school days, but um, that really was a turning point in my life and realizing that, that um, not that it was a, not that I'm blaming my parents for not doing the right thing because they didn't know, you know, I couldn't, I can't blame them. And I, I couldn't, um, um, I couldn't lean on that, that circumstance as an excuse for my behavior either. And so um, instead it shed a, a new light on my understanding and, and my situation and how I could work with God for, on a solution. And that's what really, really started to, to, to take my focus off of the, uh, the whole girl scene. But um, even so, it was, it was one of those things, it was kind of like, well, you know, you still have that habit. And you still want to, you still follow that, you still pursue it. And it drives you, it motivates you. And, and literally my whole life was just inundated with this desire to want to be with somebody. But as I began dating, I hit my 20s, I was still out of, in and out of relationships, and uh, and finally, I just, you know, after a, uh, a couple of bad breakups, I was just like, you know, I've had enough. I'm, I'm so tired of trying to find somebody in the world. I'm so tired of trying to find somebody who, who isn't fulfilling my desires, who isn't, who isn't godly. And not to say that people, are, you know, aren't, aren't 
um, worthy or, 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 or awesome people out in the world, but um, truly there is something about somebody who is spiritual that, that really just makes life easier. And, and it's not to diminish or demean anybody who, who isn't spiritual, but I, I realize that um, it, when, I, when I decided to make that decision, I made the decision. And that's where I fell. I made the decision, and I was like, I'm going to do this. And that's where, I, where my problem was. So I, I, went to the Adventist, I went to these Adventist Singles website. I started hanging out with the 20-somethings in Spokane, and I started dealing, um, you know, trying to get involved in the scene and trying to find a girl that was, that was spiritual and that was motivated and all this thing, but all the while not being spiritual myself. And so I was looking for it, but I wasn't it. And that's something we cannot do. I have, to fix, I have to fix myself. I have to let Jesus into my life first before he can change and, and move into my heart. Or before I can, I can uh, step out and, and he can trust me with somebody else. So this ultimately led me to um, enrolling into a, an Adventist singles retreat up in Hayden Lake, Idaho. And uh, I went to the singles retreat ex- with high expectations. When I got there, it was all people over, you know, 50, you know, 50s and above. And I was like, well, I don't know if this is going to work out so well. But uh, all the same, um, I, I stayed and I, I, had a great, I had a great time. And I met, I met a, a lot of awesome um, uh, mature ladies and with, <laughs> with lovely daughters. They all said they all had daughters. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. So... I met, I met one in particular, and she was so excited. She was like, oh, my daughter, she's, you know, so she, she gets on Facebook or MySpace, and she's MySpace on her and all this stuff, and I'm like, I'm like wow, this is, this, is, this is really happening, you know? I mean, could this be my opportunity, you know? And so after this, uh, this retreat was over, I, I started talking with this young lady, and we began um, a, a, a kind of a long-distance relationship. She lived in Walla Walla, and I lived in Spokane. And uh, I ended up meeting her about a month afterward, and we started dating, and, it, you know, literally, it just, it, the whole relationship, we just dove, it was just downhill. But, I mean, we thought it was great because we were having a great time together, we were doing all these things, but, but spiritually and emotionally and physically, it was just tanking. And so, after about a month or so, um, we had just discussed some things, and we were like, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm 24, you're 26, let's, let's talk about, you know, our, our life together. And so we began to discuss the option of marriage, and so I asked her to marry me, and I was thinking, you know, later on down the road that, um, you know, we'd get married a year later or so, and uh, she was like, no, I want to do it this, this year. And this was in 2007. She, she, was, she said, I want to do it in September. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is, whoa, you know. And I didn't really think, I'm like, okay, great, you know, fair enough. So let's do it. So a couple months later, we, we were married. And, um, you know, we, we moved in uh, to an apartment in Spokane, and we had, um, I thought everything was okay. And then the worst happened. She left me. And... It was because of my previous dysfunctional relationships and because my, my lack of understanding how to truly love somebody is the reason why that I came into the position that I was in. And when she left me, I was like, I was devastated. I was like, what did I do wrong? I thought I knew how to love. And the Bible says in Proverbs 1, verse 5 and 7, it says, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and, of un- and, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And certainly this, this rang true with me is that I didn't, I didn't seek the correction that God had. I didn't look to the scriptures. I didn't focus upon him and his way and what he had for my life. And so during this, as, as she left me, I was just... In a, an emotional wreck. I spent two weeks, I just, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I was a disaster, I was, I was just focusing on myself, on my, my self-pity, I was wallowing in my own disaster, my own selfish needs, and she, uh, after about two weeks, she, uh, she came back, and I helped her move her stuff out, and she was gone. 
And it was this month, to the, to the month in 2007 that this happened, and I spent my first Thanksgiving alone without my wife. I spent my first Christmas alone without my wife. And it broke my heart. But I learned that through that, that God can raise us up. When we're at the bottom of our barrel, when I'm, I was at the bottom of mine, I was, I was broke out through the bottom of it. I was digging a six-foot hole. And the Lord, the Lord came to me and he said, you know what? There's something better. I have something for you. And I turned to him and I gave everything I had to him. And I poured myself into him and it changed my life. For the first time in my life, I felt the peace of Jesus Christ. And he changed me. And he could do the same for you. It was a tough time. I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but from that time on, I just poured myself into studying the scriptures and, and the spirit of prophecy. And for the first time in my life, I actually read through a spirit of prophecy. I believed in Ellen White. I believed everything she said, but I never had read through one of her books. And for the first time, I read, I think I started with The Great Controversy. And I was blown away. I was absolutely floored by the things, that, the truths that, that were presented in there from, from God. And wow, you know, and I didn't stop there. I didn't stop there. I, I, began to, I began to read all of her books. I started reading. I read the entire Conflict of the Ages series. I poured over other books. I, I was going through scripture. I got relationship books and was just blasting through relationship books because I was like, Lord, if she comes back, I want to be ready. I want to be ready to, to support her. I want to be ready to do the right thing. And so I just, I gave myself over to Christ 100%. And that's what we have to do. We have to give ourselves 100% wholly to God. <clears throat> and certainly during this time um, of trial came the greatest benefit. Because Christ was there to, to pick me up. He was there to catch me when I was falling. And in the, in, the, in the Chinese language, the tr trial means a door of opportunity. And I, I opened that door, and opportunity was just abounding. Because I was, I was fully trusting in Jesus Christ. I was standing upon his, on his shoulders, and I was looking to him for my, for, my, for my new life. Now, I don't recommend anyone to divorce, but I was willing to surrender my life, and he freed me from that old life. He freed me from that life of, of, of r broken relationships and, and dysfunctional living and all that, all that stuff, all that stuff that I don't want. And everywhere I went, I was praising God. I was listening to CDs. I was listening to everything I could get my hands on in my car. And it was changing my life. It was literally moving me. And I was seeing the differences. I was seeing my attitude was changing, my, my, the way I was looking at people. And, and one of the greatest things that I learned was that, that love is more than just a feeling. It's an action. It is doing something for somebody else. And, and it even goes beyond that because even before we can love, we have to choose to honor those around us. And I chose to honor those people that, that were in my life before. And I had to call, literally the Lord convicted me to call all my ex-girlfriends and to apologize to them and to ask for forgiveness from them. And I tell you what, that was the most humbling experience of my life. But I chose to honor, and God honored me. And out of that, I grew into a love of Jesus Christ that I've never experienced before. And I promise you that if you choose to honor people, that God will honor you and you can grow in his love. Certainly the results of living a life unto God far outweigh the results of living a life unto self. And I was realizing that. And, and as I began to learn about love, I learned, to begin, I learned about the facts of love. I learned about the nature of love. And certainly my feelings of certain things were a reflection of what I honored. I don't know if you guys caught that. But that's a powerful statement. That is one of the most, that is one of the, the biggest key statements that I learned in my life, that feelings are a reflection of what we honor. If you hate something, it's because you don't honor it. 
When you see somebody you don't like, instead of looking at them as somebody you don't like, paint, paint some, find the biggest thing or the, most, the, most, uh, the thing that you desire the most. Maybe it's a Lamborghini or maybe it's a Stradivarius uh, you know, violin or something or maybe it's a million bucks. Pa- plaster that on their forehead and say, I honor that person. You know, not that they're a Lamborghini or they're a Stradivarius, but because it holds, a, it holds that person at a high value. And because we hold people at a high value, it changes us. It changes us. It transforms. It puts this, the love of Christ in us, and it just, it just oozes out of us. We just can't help but love other people. Now, getting divorced is not the answer in every situation. But certainly waiting for the bad to come or for the bad to happen to go to Christ is the worst thing you can do. Learn to run to him now so that when the bad does come, you have somebody to lean upon. I waited too long for that and it destroyed my life. But as, as the story goes, this is back in, 2000, uh, in 2009, um, about a year and a half after my wife left me, um, my I finally had to give up, and I, I tried everything I could to keep in contact with her and to do what I could, and we ended up having to get divorced. And we had my divorce hearing on Monday, and I got laid off on the Friday before. But you know what? I praise the Lord for that because he was doing something in my life. I learned that I could honor these things in my life. I learned that I could choose to do things in my life that, that I had no idea. I was like, why am I even thinking this way? Why am I even acting this way? I can't even comprehend this. But it was, it was like, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. And as this holiday season comes up in Thanksgiving, I challenge you to praise God and to thank him for what he's done in your life. Because he's done a great work in my life, and I guarantee you, he will do a great work in your life if you will let him. But you have to be willing. You have to submit. You have to surrender yourself. You have to give yourself over to Jesus Christ because you can't do anything with somebody who doesn't believe. Now, as my story goes, I moved to Nebraska after this. I had some, a few bumps in the road up to that point. I just needed to get away from Spokane. I moved to Nebraska. My brother was living in Omaha. I got shacked up with him for three months and uh, found out about Union College. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know there was college down here. It's amazing. Nebraska has something. It's amazing. <laughs> There's something here in Nebraska. No, I'm kidding. Nebraska's a nice state, but I'm from Washington. I mean, if you've ever been to Washington, I'm from, it's, it's a whole other world. No. But um, it, was, it was an amazing experience because I had, I had applied for financial aid before, and I, I, I enrolled in school, and I got accepted into Union College. And I started out as an IRR major, and I switched my major in the, in the first semester to uh, theology because I felt that God was leading me in a direction in, in that direction, and, and I, didn't, I didn't have anything else in my life that I wanted to live for. I wasn't living for climbing on ropes and mountains and rescuing people. I wanted to save people in an eternal way. I wanted to save people from their sins I, or help, it, help Jesus, uh, you know, bring people to Christ so that he could save them from their sins, excuse me. But with that call comes great responsibility. And I stand before you today be, not because of anything that I have done because, but because of what Christ has done in me. But I must, I must continue my story because it gets better, and I must thank God for the things that he has done in my life. After getting enrolled in school, I met a wonderful, bashful, sincere woman of Christ, of Jesus Christ, uh, somebody who was willing to be spiritual, somebody who was willing to give her life, somebody who was willing to do for me what I have been always longing to do or longing to have, somebody to fulfill me and my, my physical, my emotional, my, my, my spiritual walk, and she has lifted my life out of, uh, above, far, far above what I, and, and not because of her, it's because of Christ. It's Christ brought her to me. Sorry, our PowerPoint died, so we'll have to leave that alone, but it was in the, uh, the fall of 2009 that I met Rachel, and it was in the uh, Larson Lifestyle Center at Union College. Um, she was a very bashful, as I said. And uh, she would never look at me in the eye. And I thought, you know, she's really stuck up, man. What's wrong with this girl? 
you know. So, <laughs> and not that I was trying to be mean or anything, but I was just like, man, what is this? Kid? So I was like, all right, this is a challenge, and I'll, I'll take a challenge. So I went to the PG, and I don't know how many of you know what the PG is, the peanut gallery. It's got everybody's names and stuff. And I looked her up, and I was like, what's this girl's name? So I went in the weight room a couple days later, and I, she was there, and I, was, I said, hey, Rachel. And that caught her off guard. She, huh? This guy knows my name. So she had to go back, and she had to go PG me. So I was kind of like, yeah, that's right. What's up? No. But uh, she, uh, she PG'd me, and um, I ended up later on Facebooking her. She, she said hi to me, but it was, it was through much reluctance. <laughs> but uh, she, uh, uh, we, I Facebooked her, I added her as a friend, and we uh, started talking about Arbor. Um, we started talking about getting together, and I uh, asked her if I could interview her for, uh, for a class that I was taking. And so uh, she said, sure. You know, with, later on, I found out that she was very reluctant to even friend me on Facebook because she had, she had heard some things about my past. And I'm like, you can't judge a man by his past. You got to judge a man by the way he, by his character now, you know. And so, and certainly she didn't know all the stuff that was going on, but um, it was, it was quite an interesting first date. We, uh, I, I talked and talked and talked and talked, and she just said yes and no and yes and no. I was like, this is a disaster. What am I, I mean, she's not talking to me. I don't know what to do. And so, <laughs> well, one thing led to another, and we ended up dating. We started dating in February of 2010, and it was a magnificent journey. And the Lord has blessed me so tremendously, and, and uh, we got married in um, August of 2011, We've been married for two years now, and it's been the greatest, greatest time of my life. Amen. I wouldn't trade it, trade it for the world, and I know that the Lord has a plan for me in my life, and I know that he has a plan for you in your life. I know that each of you have the testimony, and that as you go from this place today, that you will, you will spend some time thinking about your life and about formulating a testimony for those who may be in need, for those who may be looking and searching and longing for, for uh, uh, just a, a little bit of, of some hope. Because people are looking for hope in this world. I was looking for hope. I, had, I was in the church. I was living in the Adventist church. I was living the lifestyle. I was, I was going to church. I was going to the Pilux. I was, I was doing all the things. But at the same time, I wasn't, I didn't have that hope. I didn't have that hope. But once I found it, once I came to the realization that Christ wants to be with me, that Christ wants me with him, it changed my life, and it can change yours. I promise you. Don't resist the Spirit's calling on for your life today. Don't resist Jesus' calling in your life today. Pick up your Bible. Learn to trust and learn to honor him, and he will honor you. And I stand before you today, not, not on my own on my own merits, but on the, on the merits of Jesus Christ. And he has, he has lifted me up. And I know that he'll lift you up. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the testimony that you can give to each one of us, Lord. As Christians, we have a mighty testimony of a, of a Savior who has done what we cannot do for ourselves. He died for us upon the cross, Lord. And I pray that as we go from this place, that we accept you into our lives today. And that we would not look unto ourselves, but we would look to you. Transform us, Lord. May we have a total transformation of life and character. May we learn to honor and to trust you, O Lord. I pray that each one here would be blessed and even more abundantly blessed as they grow in their testimony and their knowledge of you, Lord. Lord, be with us today. May your spirit dwell with us. And may you be our God. And may we be your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.